Well, it is a joy to be with you. This, I was telling Arnie when I flew up here, this is the farthest north I've been in the continental United States in my life, and I'll be 54 this next week. So um, I am a southern boy, southern born, southern raised, uh, now living in southern Illinois. That was, that was uh, that's Yankee Town, our Yankees area for me. Uh, God knows how to play jokes on southern people. I live in the land of Lincoln, um, and that is uh, something when you're very Confederate-oriented southern states, that's, uh, that's God's joke. And he put it right on my license plate, so I c couldn't cover it up either. So uh, uh, God has a great sense of humor. Uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. But it is good to be here with you, and uh, I am, uh, my name is Bill Smith. I'm from Carbondale at present. Uh, I'm at Cornerstone Reformed Church there, and yes, I am presiding minister at Tyndale Presbytery, uh, and it is good to visit one of the churches in the Presbytery here. What I'm going to talk about today uh, is wisdom. Uh, I'm going to, in the Sunday school, going to introduce wisdom, and then we're going to focus on one aspect uh, of wisdom in, uh, in the sermon this morning. So you here will get kind of the foundations, and uh, the rest of the congregation will have to catch up when we get to the sermon. I want to begin by reading a passage from Proverbs, the eighth chapter, and uh, beginning in verse 12. Um, I wisdom dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of Yahweh is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign. And rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule, and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries." Yahweh possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from Yahweh. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. And thus far, God's word. Life is pretty simple when you're young. Everything, everything is laid out for you. There are clear rules to follow little responsibility. And of course, it, in your younger years, you think you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. However, you don't think much about the purpose, your purpose in life, and how things are all supposed to work. Your mind is maybe on your next meal, the next game, or your homework assignment. The extent of thinking about your purpose might be, why do I have to take algebra? Uh, how is that going to be useful? But beyond that, you're probably not thinking too much about the meaning of it all. The older you become, however, the more you have to think about how life is supposed to work and its meaning. You begin asking questions, searching. But what are you looking for? You're looking for wisdom. You're looking for wisdom. I've been preaching through Proverbs uh, presently in my church, so pretty much every invitation I have to speak is going to be on Proverbs. So that's, what you're, that's why you're getting this. The context of Proverbs is this. Solomon, a father and a king, is instructing his son, a king in waiting, the prince, in ways of wisdom. I'll get to the importance of the father instructing the future king in wisdom in a moment, but first we need to understand what wisdom is. 
Now, we could spend a great amount of time exploring and answering the question, what is wisdom? But we don't have a great amount of time. So consequently, I'll only be able to hit some of the basics here in Sunday school. We begin with the definition, and then we're, I'm going to work from there. Wisdom is all about relationships. It's not only, it not only deals with the basics of right and wrong, which is your fundamental relationship, sin versus righteousness, but also what is appropriate versus what is inappropriate, what is best versus what is acceptable, what is beautiful, which is over against what is just kind of pragmatic, all those types of things. Wisdom is the ability to see how relationships ought to be and the skill to make them so. Wisdom is an art that works with things and people so as to make them fit together so that they are good, the true, and beautiful, fulfilling God's purpose for them. Wisdom is introduced to us in Proverbs 8. It's shown, it's, and wisdom is shown in Wisdom, uh, wisdom is shown in his creation of the world. And what we find in Proverbs 8 is that wisdom is indeed a person. We hear in Proverbs 8.30 that he is a master craftsman, a master workman. He's creating the world. He, he knew how everything was supposed to be. When you go back to Genesis chapter 1, that's where you see God creating the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And then you start going over all of the creation, and what God does there is he begins to separate, pull things apart, put them back together in new relationships so that they, at the end of each day and at the end of the all, all, all the creation week, they are good. God knows how everything is supposed to fit together. Wisdom is the one who's putting all these things together. He puts everything in proper relationship with the other thing so that everything is declared good. This is everything from light and dark to the man and the woman at the apex of creation. Now, good, when God says that, is more than just morally good. That's understood without sin. It is beautiful. It is the way things ought to be in every respect. It is it, it, so that there is complete harmony. There is peace with everything. Everything relates to everything else the way it ought to. Now, we have a human example of wisdom in a man you may not know much about. His name is Bezalel. When God makes new creation, he grants wisdom. When he's going to work through someone, this person becomes wisdom incarnate. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt after destroying the old creation, all the old world of Egypt, his plan was to make a new world, a new creation. And this new world was enshrined quite literally in the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was this palatial tent the footstool of God's throne in which heaven and earth were joined together. As such, the tabernacle was a representation of what the end, the purpose of the whole creation was to be. The earth that was glorified so that heaven and earth could be joined together. We just sang about this. Revelation 21 gives us a clear vision of this. As John sees, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Moses was given the heavenly pattern in the mount along with a great deal of instruction about how to construct this tabernacle. However, there was not enough instruction that recorded in Exodus 25 and following. There's not enough instruction really to complete the work. Now, as you go through Exodus 25 to 40, and let, except for that little narrative in there, 32 to 34, your eyes probably glaze over when you start, ta start talking about all the details of the tabernacle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, why are we worried about sockets and all this kind of stuff? What's going on here? And we think it's meticulous. Well, if you tried to construct a tabernacle out of that, you wouldn't get everything that you would need. This is where Bezalel comes in. In Exodus 31, verses 1 to 5, we hear, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, 
in understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. The spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom. The one who brooded over the original creation, setting things in order. Bezalel is wisdom incarnate, working alongside Yahweh as the master craftsman to create this new world. Moses, standing in the place of Yahweh, has wisdom work beside him. He gives the, the blueprint, and Bezalel begins to work it out. Bezalel knows how gold, silver, bronze, goat's hair, dolphin skins, and many other things ought to be shaped to make this new creation and to join heaven and earth. God says that the cherubim should be on top of the ark and in embroidery in the curtains. And he has the wisdom to know how they ought to look. We're not told exactly how they're supposed to look. He knows, he's supposed, he knows how to put them together. He has the skill to put them in the right relationship with everything else. You see, wisdom is an art in this way, not confined to just black and white rules all the time. It has all the basic rules down. Please don't get me wrong. It doesn't neglect the rules. It has all the fundamentals down. But it knows how to put things together in a way that obeys all the rules, but glorifies them even more. For instance, wisdom knows the basics of painting, shades and colors, but wisdom goes beyond paint by numbers. Wisdom knows the basics of music, knows all the names and notes and intervals and chords and chord progressions and how they fit together and when, when something's going to sound right and when something's not going to sound right. They, wisdom knows all this, but wisdom can take all of those and create new and more glorious music with them and not simply play scales all the time. Wisdom understands relationships, knowing how to put things together that don't violate the fundamental rules, but sees how they are applied in various contexts in creative ways to make them good, to glorify them, to make them more than they were before to make them beautiful, harmonious, peaceful. Solomon is something of a new, more mature Bezalel. Like Bezalel, he builds God's house, the temple. That's a more mature form of the tabernacle. Now, he receives less instruction about how to build the temple than Bezalel received to build the tabernacle. David did leave him with some basic plans, but Solomon was wise. He knew how things ought to be put together. Solomon in, a, but in Solomon is a greater truth about the house of God. That is, the temple is the people of God. Now, this was true of the tabernacle, too. The tabernacle, the tabernacle is a representation of God's people. God's people have always been God's house. Bezalel anticipated Solomon, both of them being from the kingly tribe of Judah. But whereas Bezalel only worked on the tent, Solomon oversaw the construction of the temple and he judged people. Thus, he makes the connection between the temple structure and the temple as people clearer. Solomon is a king who rules God's people. He constructs the architectural wonder that stood in Jerusalem for hundreds of years, but he's also a king. He's a supreme judge who was supposed to put living stones of God's household together. One of the things the king was supposed to do was have a copy of the law, and he was to study that law. He was to have that law in his heart. He was to go over it again and again and again. This was one of the requirements of the king that Moses left in Deuteronomy. He was supposed to have that. And he was to do this in order to execute justice because at the basic, the law of God shows us basic wisdom, how to put things together to create justice, to create peace, and justice is peace. He was supposed to execute justice. Justice should not be thought of as merely punishment. It may involve that, but the purpose of justice is peace, to rightly order relationships so that they are whole and healthy, so that they are beautiful and harmonious. Now Solomon is tested in this regard when the two prostitutes come to him in a dispute over the baby. Now, you have to understand this. There's no law in Moses that tells a king how to deal with that kind of situation. He has to take the fundamentals that he's learned, that have been on his heart from his youth, 
that he's gone over and over and over again. And he has to figure out what to do in this situation using the fundamentals and applying them to this situation. He had to understand what a mother was in her relationship to her baby. God's law really doesn't spell that out. He had to understand the envy between women as well as the care of a mother for her child. None of that is given in detail in Scripture, but it can be deduced by understanding God's revelation of the way he made women as well as through observation. And he can put those two things together and say, okay, now I need to work this out how I'm going to settle this dispute. And so Solomon sets the relationships in order creating peace, understanding all those things, understanding the nature of women in general, mothers in particular, and their relationships to their babies and everything else. And that's why he comes up with this, well, I'll just divide the baby in half. And he knew that the real mother would not want that. The envious mother would. But that's not something that God spells out in his law. That's wisdom. Wisdom does this. Paul takes up all of these images in his first letter to the Corinthians when he speaks about building God's house. As an apostle, he is a wise master builder. That's not, that's not just a, a, a metaphor Paul uses out of the blue. He's a wise master builder in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. He's building on the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones, all temple imagery, instead of wood, hay, and stubble. Paul knows what the church ought to look like based on the pattern laid down by the foundation, Jesus Christ. Those are the fundamentals. And now he has to build the temple. In the wisdom God, granted to him by God, he is arranging what Peter calls living stones into a building. This is much more difficult than Bezalel's job. Because Bezalel was working with inanimate objects. And anybody can tell you, and as a pastor I can tell you, it is much more satisfying to go garden or to build something than it is to work with people. Amen. It's the truth. Why? Because if, if I build something, if I, if I mess it up, I tear it down, redo it. And those things don't talk back. They don't move. They don't shake. They just do. And... You do, and it, and it works, or you do, and it doesn't work. And it's quite black and white, quite simple. People are, living stones aren't like that. They wiggle. They shake. They shimmy. They, they have all kinds of issues that they're dealing with, and you think you have them in place, and all of a sudden they move. Paul's working with living stones building in the building. This is much more difficult than Bezalel's job. Bezalel does not envy Paul, I guarantee you, <laughs> Okay. He had wisdom. Paul has wisdom. People require even greater wisdom because being living stones means that you won't stay in place. Nevertheless, all of this goes to the fact that wisdom is about relationships, knowing how things and people ought to fit together and the skill to put them in place to create what is good, true, and beautiful. Now, God is all wise. He knows comprehensively how everything fits together. And he has the skill and power to make them what he wants them to be. He does. He is all wise. He, he does everything. He works everything out in the world. He does this with the pristine, untarnished creation on the first six days of history. But he also does so now through the wickedness of men. God put the whole world right in his wisdom through the most sinful act ever committed, the crucifixion of his son. Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 1, this is the wisdom of God, a wisdom that is foolishness to the world and baffles our minds. Now, God is all wise, and we are not. We don't know and can't know all things comprehensively. Our wisdom is limited, which is one reason why we can't use evil so that good may come. The ends don't justify the means. We aren't that skilled. We will never reach that level. We'll never be able to put evil together in order to make good. God is alone can do that. 
Never, and so that, that's why Paul can say, we don't, we don't do evil so that good may come. You're not that wise, you never will be. Only God can do that, and that is mysterious and left to him. Nevertheless, we can and must have wisdom, even though it is limited. Wisdom is sometimes mistaken for the simplistic ability of applied knowledge. And if I have wisdom, I can make everything work. I can leverage the world to whatever I want it to be and, and do anything I want to do. I can fix everything if, I've, if I just have enough wisdom. Well, there's partial truth in this, which makes it quite dangerous. Wisdom involves skill to make the things the way that they ought to be. But that skill is limited and operates within the wisdom of the all-wise God. Wisdom doesn't know everything, and wisdom can't fix everything. In fact, there are some things that we can't fix and weren't meant to be fixed by us. Ecclesiastes 7.13 says, Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what he has made crooked? God has given us wisdom. We are to grow in wisdom. But we will never be all wise. True human wisdom recognizes its limitations and submits to the all-wise God who does all things well. We use all the wisdom we can in every situation, but at the end of the day, we're submissive to the wisdom of God. For example, we know that the human body is supposed to have certain characteristics so that it is considered whole and healthy. Jesus put people back together through healing regularly in his ministry. We have doctors who have learned a great deal about the human body and can do wonderful things. I'm very thankful for the medical community. But there are some things that can't be fixed. There's sometimes the doctor comes in and says, I can't do anything. I can't put this back together. Death itself is that reality. There are some times they can't stop it. All right? We run up against our wisdom limitations all the time, whether dealing with our physiology or our psychology. And it can be frustrating, for example, to know how people ought to be acting or to know how people ought to fit together and how they ought to be acting toward one another, giving them the tools to live by, but then, they, but then see them totally mess up their lives. You don't have all power to make things the way they ought to be. Sometimes you do make things the way they ought to be, and then someone else comes along and messes it up. As Solomon brings out in Ecclesiastes, having wisdom can actually be frustrating at times. I know too much. Which brings me to answer the question, then, why do I need wisdom? Why do I, why do I need to pursue wisdom? Why can't I just be dumb and happy? <laughs> Well, if it, is, if it is something that I never master, if it is something that I will never achieve comprehensively, then why even bother? Well, there are a number of reasons we ought to be pursuing wisdom. First, we are clearly instructed by God to pursue wisdom. God says through Solomon's instruction to his son, get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. Even if we don't understand all the whys, we should trust the all-wise God who knows what is best for us, who never gives us empty pursuits. He always has a reason why he tells us to do what we need to do. And it is always good for our good. Second, wisdom, uh, second pursuing wisdom concerns our ever-deepening relationship with God. Now, remember, wisdom above all things is a person. And that person is Christ Jesus himself. Our God has a personal relationship with us. He relates to us as persons. Relationships between persons are never static. We never master relationships with one another. We come to know one another better, but we never master knowledge of the other person. One of the reasons is we're always growing. We're always moving. <laughs> Pursuing wisdom is about a persevering, growing, growing relationship with God. 
It's not about achieving a degree that we can say, well, I've obtained that doctor of wisdom degree. Now I can move on with my life to something else. It is about staying in relationship with God and knowing him better. Just because you will never know him comprehensively doesn't mean that you should stop pursuing the relationship. The journey in some way is the point of the whole thing. The journey is the gift. Just because you will never know your spouse comprehensively doesn't mean that you should stop pursuing that relationship. You can get to know one another well, but as you change through the years, you're still going to have to get to know one another. The older you get, the more we change, the more we learn one another. You pursue that relationship and want to maintain it because you love your spouse. The same could be said with parents and children and friends and other family members. Love pursues wisdom because wisdom is all about knowing the other person, about being in relationship with this person. Third, we need to pursue wisdom because we have a mission to create. Going back to the purpose of Proverbs, Solomon is writing in order to instruct his soon-to-be king son in the way of wisdom. Why is this? What is, what is going on with Solomon and his son? What's the context? His son would be a new Adam who was commissioned to take dominion over the world, cultivating the ground, developing cultures, and making the world a place that looks like heaven so that God and man could dwell together in joyful peace. Now, wisdom, we learned, is a master craftsman. The spirit of wisdom hovered over the world in the beginning for this purpose. The same spirit of wisdom enabled Bezalel, Solomon, and Paul to build the house of God. God didn't save us only for the purpose of escaping hell. Of course, that's a great benefit. But salvation is a call to participate in the life of God himself. We are called to join with him in his mission. We pursue wisdom because we are participating in the life mission of God. We are in a creation project that requires the wisdom of God. God's laid out the basic structure, disciple the nations. You say, okay, how do we do that? Pursue wisdom. Figure it out. I want more black and white instruction. Nope, not going to give you any. You're going to have to pursue wisdom. You're going to have to figure this out as you go because that's what it means to grow up in wisdom. And you have, you and I have this mission to create. We pursue wisdom because we want to participate in that life of God. Created and recreated as the image of God, work is a part of what it means to be human, to live, to fulfill your purpose as man, and consequently to be fulfilled. You must work. Work requires wisdom. Your creative, productive work has a purpose, and that purpose is to put things in proper relationship so that there's harmony, joy, beauty, and peace. In order to create these relationships with inanimate objects as well as interpersonal relationships in your home or on the job, you need wisdom. When we start talking about relationships like this and I talk about the home, And we we hear Paul in Ephesians 5 or Colossians 3 talk about, you know, husbands loving your wives, wives submitting to husbands, children obeying parents. We say, okay, what does that look like in this situation? Well, you got to figure that out. We can get you some general principles about what to do. You can read Federal Husband or you can read, uh, you know, Nancy's books. Uh, You can read For Glory and a Covering. You can read all these books about this. And some of those things give great wisdom but you're married to a certain person and you have general rules about men. You have general ideas about who women are, what they are, but you have a specific wife. Who is she? You got to figure this out. Wives, you have a specific husband. You may know a lot about men in general, but he is, he is, he is your mission. How do you figure that out? You have to be creative. You have to apply these principles. There's no, there's no, there's no, uh, cut and paste. (laughs) No paint by numbers. And you have to think, you have to work and pursue wisdom in these relationships. And this is part of the mission. And as you do that, that's the the beautiful thing about wisdom. Your relationship deepens. If you just had 
cut and paste, paint by numbers. There's no challenge in that. There's no, there, and there's no depth in that. But as you, as you grow and as your love, as your love pursues wisdom in those relationships, you are then, you are then drawn closer to one another and that your relationship is more beautiful. The fourth, we pursue wisdom because we are called to rule. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers, uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 and 2. We are called to rule with Christ in fulfillment of God's original purpose, making decisions that can result in life or death. To rule as we ought, we need wisdom in how to order our, per order our personal lives, our family, the church, and if called to it, the larger society around us. Wisdom is needed by kings. Proverbs 8.15 says, by me, by wisdom, kings reign. People who rule require more than a set of simple rules to follow. People are messy. We need wisdom to handle the responsibilities God has given to us. We can't rule without it, and so it must be pursued. Wisdom is, as mentioned, concerned about relationships with people. We are called to build people. We must pursue wisdom because we love people. And we understand that we can't handle them like computers. Wisdom loves and is therefore personal. And since we are called to love people, we must pursue wisdom. Last, we must pursue wisdom because God has called us to mature, to grow up and be like him. We have to move from the basics of understanding the notes on the piano to becoming Bach and Mozart, how to take those notes and make them something more beautiful, how to compose. This is maturity, and that's what God has called us to. In one way or another, everything I've been talking about is, is growing up in maturity, and you, because wisdom is the path to maturity, that's what you have to pursue. God wants us all to grow up and be conformed to the image of Christ, who is wisdom. So to grow up in Christ is to grow in wisdom. We pursue wisdom because pursuing wisdom is nothing more than speaking about our continuing growing life as Christians. So in the words of Solomon, get wisdom. And like I said in the sermon, I will teach you one area in which wisdom should be pursued. That's all I've got for now. Um, we, uh, I, I, not self-promoting here, but I just signed a contract, or I'm, just, I'm signing a contract for a series on Proverbs uh, for books, which will have a lot more explanation about this. It's kind of hard to come in and, and just do one or two lessons and then walk off, um, but it'll all be in my books, okay? <laughs> that and more, all right? Are there any questions? We have a little time, right? Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions? A little bitty waters. Yes, ma'am. We're figuring that out. My working title is by, it's going to be a series of books. That's my plan. Depends on how the publisher, how it goes with the publisher the first round. <laughs> but it's going to be uh, by, uh, by me, King's Reign. It's going to be the name of the series. That's the working title right now. Yes, sir. Oh, I know you. Yes, you do. <laughs> How do you measure proficiency and wisdom at various stages? You know, in, in the workplace, it, to qualify someone to do an excellent job, we have to identify what are the proficiencies that they need, the skills, and then we need to measure them and to know what's left to work on if it's not proficient. How do you measure a child or a young adult or an old adult's proficiency? Did everybody hear that question? How do you measure proficiency? Um, good question. I think one of the things you have to do is, is give responsibility. See how people handle the responsibility. This is how you understand how much a child, uh, and this is where parenting is, is, is difficult, as some of you know, uh, because you think your child is going to be responsible. 
But the only way, the only way to see how much wisdom he has and how much proficiency he has is to put on him the burden of responsibility and see how he can handle that. And that's what God does with us. And he, he puts on us these burdens, our responsibilities, and then we have, to, we have to come up to them. And sometimes people are going to fail. And you say, and in business, I think it would be called the Peter principle. You know, somebody rises to the level of his incompetence. Is that, is that correct? And you can do, that, can ha that can happen. You can say, okay, he's not ready for that. You know, he, he, this is not his area. This is not his skill. But when you're, for instance, when you have a son and you think he's responsible enough at, at uh, a certain age to handle a knife, um, you give him the knife and you say, you explain to him all the dangers and everything else, and then he can show wisdom in how uh, he handles that. He handles the responsibility. Same with a gun or uh, I'm just using weapons here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm from the South. <laughs> uh, or, or driving. You know, he gets to be whatever the age is here, 14, 15, 16 years old, and he uh, has a permit. And you have to teach him all these things, and you have to see whether or not he's going to be able to uh, uh, be proficient and have wisdom in order, to, in order to operate those things. But that's... You have, to put you have to put responsibility on people in order to call them up to see, uh, in order to develop wisdom, and also to test their wisdom, I would, I would say. If anybody else has anything to add to that, you're welcome to add it. Yeah, do you have something to add to it? Well, some things can't be learned without suffering, so I know that Absolutely. that's another way God tests us in things about wisdom. Us. Absolutely, yes. Exactly. Yeah, and so that was that was my point. Um, we're fond of saying there's a ditch on both sides of the road, right? Um, but I think the besetting ditch for most parents, and especially for most moms, is they don't want their kids to fail, and so they don't challenge them enough at the earliest of ages, right? Um, but it'd be like a, a boy or a girl never lifting anything their whole life. strength by pushing yourself and failing. And oftentimes parents don't want the kids to fail, but you learn through failing. And the father and the mother learn. And if the kid is still advancing or petering out, to use the example mm -hmm. you gave, if they entrust them with more money. And you always have to have a safety net, right? When you get a knife, it's always a safety net. But yet, you still need to encourage that because that's how you grow in, grow in wisdom. Otherwise you stay foolish um, and we see examples of that in young adults and adults that just, you know, they don't run the responsibility. Right. Oftentimes, oftentimes taught in the church that the working definition of being a man is one who runs the responsibility. And if your kids can't even admit that they made a mistake or they're at fault, then there's work, plenty of work to be done for the parents. Right. That's it. The question I was going to ask is, um, what would you say to the people that read the Proverbs and say, oh, this book was written for you know, sons of kings, and I'm, I, my dad's a king, right? <laughs> well, why, why, why do I need to pay attention to this? I'm never going to rule anything. First of all, your father is a king, because uh, you have a heavenly father who's a king. There's that. Small huh. detail. Um, but yes, you are. Uh, and that's one of the things I, I think that, first of all there are a couple of misconceptions about Proverbs um, one of them one of them is and I'll, I'll get to your question probably need to write it down so I don't forget it um, one of them is that Proverbs is just this pragmatic book that it's uh, he's writing a lot of great stuff about do's and don'ts and things like that Solomon is a tremendous theologian the more I've studied Proverbs, the more I understand he's, he, is, he, he, he has deep, deep theology, okay? A lot of things undergird this. Secondly, Solomon is not short-sighted. A lot of people say, well, these are general maxims that might work out if you're not in North Korea under a communist regime 
if you're in America in a very free society, these things are probably true most of the time. <laughs> but that's not the way Solomon's working, okay? He has, a, he has uh, used a big word, he has an eschatological vision, that is long-term final results. And going back to the thing about rule, we do, first of all, we do rule with Christ. It's one of the things that the, uh, the, the scriptures state. But one of the things, and there's a, uh, a theme that I've traced through Proverbs on discipline that actually starts at the beginning of the book, and this is the purpose of the book. That, and it's, it's translated instruction in most of our translations. But the word is discipline, and it, it's a self chase. It's a chastening lesson, um, and that discipline, talking about ruling, that discipline begins by ruling me. Everybody has something to rule. All right, when God created everything, created the man, then He created a garden. He created the man out of the dust of the ground. And then he created this garden. One of the things that he was paralleling there is that man is a garden. You're a little plot of dirt, okay? You're a dirt bag, right? All right? And this is indicated in a number of different ways with the image of your scripture. Man has seed, woman takes a seed, she grows a child, and that is the fruit of the womb. Now, that's all garden imagery. Okay, that's, that's one of the reasons why translations a lot of times mess up when they start talking about just offspring or descendants and uh, things like that. That's, the Bible is wanting you to make the connection. You are a plot of ground. You bear the fruit of the Spirit. All right? So you're a plot of ground. So what are you supposed to do with your little plot of ground, your garden? You're supposed to cultivate it. You're supposed to rule it. You're supposed to take dominion over it. Dominion begins, your rule begins with you. Self-discipline. This goes back, back to your question about proficiencies and things like that. Teaching them how to discipline themselves because that's the end goal of what Solomon is doing with his son in Proverbs is not that discipline will have to be imposed upon him because that's what happens to a fool. That they have to be beaten with rods. But he wants his son to do that to himself. <laughs> to discipline himself, to control himself so that others will not control him, so that he can truly be free. And that freedom is self-discipline. So he is teaching his son primarily and fundamentally to rule himself. And once he rules himself, or as he learns to rule himself, he becomes proficient to rule other things. I'm going to talk about that in the sermon, about progressively how uh, this happens. We, this is how uh, we grow in wisdom. This is how we grow in responsibility, is that uh, you're given some responsibility. You, you become proficient. You handle that really well. Somebody recognizes that, and they say, well, I think you can handle more responsibility. I think you can grow. I think you can, I think you can do more here. And that's what happens when we become when we become self-disciplined, when we are on that track to be disciplined in ourselves, then God says he can handle more responsibility. He can handle a bigger garden. Okay? So I, I learned self-discipline. This is one of the things that I think is a, is a problem, especially with uh, young men and the way they think about marriage. I'm going to a completely, it's not a completely different, but a, an interesting illustration, I think. A lot of young men think, you know, here's how I'm going to solve my sexual problems, my porn problems, my all that. I'm going to get married. Because Paul says it's better to marry than to burn. And, and yes, Paul does say that. But you're getting things all backwards here. All right? If, you, if, if you're thinking that marriage is going to discipline you, you're a fool. It's not going to solve that problem. You have to discipline yourself to be a husband that can actually be a good husband. So you need to get that straight before marriage. 
All right, you need to learn how to, and because your garden is expanding, and if you can't handle the little garden you've got right here, how are you going to handle the bigger garden when you bring on a wife? And then when you bring on children, you don't know how to handle yourself. Now, we could apply that to finances. We could apply that to a number of other areas. But the, the point is, we begin small. We begin with small responsibilities, ruling ourselves. And this is what Proverbs, again, there's a huge theme in Proverbs about this. When you rule yourself, then you're able to grow in your responsibilities. But uh, if, you, if you don't learn to rule yourself, you're going to have problems throughout your life. And eventually, you're just going to be controlled by others. It was interesting. I, it was one of the quotes in um, Mark Horn's book, Solomon Says, that really uh, sticks out. And I can't quote it exactly, but it was more like, if you don't control your desires, your desires will be the reins by which everybody controls you. OK? If I can't control my greed, if I can't control my desire for more possessions, Every advertisement that comes across my screen, I'm getting into debt. I'm trying, I'm try, I, can't control, I can't control myself. I got to have more. I, gotta, gotta, I just got to keep feeding the beast here. If I can't control my sexual desires, it's the same thing. A woman can control me or a man can control me if I can't control my desires. All right? So you control yourself first, and then, then you're able to... Then you're able to adequately handle the responsibility, the bigger responsibilities of family where you rule, especially in homes where mothers, fathers and mothers rule, and uh, in church and business and things like that. So it's a, it's a. Is that what I was looking for? I'll just tie it in and, and we can close it off with this. Uh, Jeff Evans um, who works at the Capitol, you know, with legislators and people literally at the city gates making decisions. You know, we, we complain oftentimes what our politicians do, right? Um, and why social health and welfare is there rather than the church, and how come they're getting into education, and how come they're telling us even the details of how we can frame a house. So we make fun of a lot of different things. But if they all resign from their jobs, would the church have wisdom to carry on? And the answer is we don't now, that's for sure. So to eschatology, down the road, if you can't rule your own body well, how can you rule a wife? How can you rule a family? How can you rule a business? And then how can you rule society? And if people aren't coming to you and saying, take on this responsibility, they certainly aren't going to do it to run society, to run government. Right, exactly. Because that's the biggest toy box. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's pray together and then we'll, uh, I guess, Take a little break and then come back for worship. All right. Father, we are grateful to you for gathering us together on this day, and we look forward to uh, coming into your presence and ascending into the heavens and uh, learning wisdom and relating to you who is wisdom. And now we pray that you would give us, uh, give us your grace, help us to understand and take on the responsibilities that you give us and, and by your spirit to handle them well and always relying upon uh, the spirit of wisdom in all that we do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.